because like I was like um, trying to find like Egyptologists. Like, don't ever Google like you know Egyptologists for hire. Like in Google, you're not going to find anything. Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman History Podcast. I am Alex Cash, and I am joined today by Brian, the Caped Crusader Anders. And today we have with us an incredible guest. That's right. If you've been following along with the show, you'll remember the homework we gave you in episode two was to go watch the documentary called Batman and Bill. If you listen to that episode, you heard all the uh, all about the inception of Batman, the story of Bill Finger and Bob Kane. If you didn't do either of those things, please stop now. Go back, because we're going to assume that you know all of that story for today, and you're going to be completely lost if you have not done those things. That's right. Today on the program, we have Mark Tyler Nobleman. Mark is the author of 86 books, ranging from colorful and funny children's fiction about chupacabras to incredible moving all-ages nonfiction about reconciliation after World War II. Mark's body of work is astounding without his contributions uh, to our understanding of Batman. But if you kept up with the homework and listened to the episodes in order, you'll know that Mark dedicated years of his life to fighting for the legacy of Bill Finger, the now credited co-creator of Batman. In 2006, he started digging into the story of the creation of Batman, and in 2012, he authored Bill the Boy Wonder, an all-ages retelling of that true story. For years, Mark waged an uh, advocacy campaign to set the record straight on the creation of Batman and get Bill Finger the credit he deserved. In September 2015, due in no small part to the work that Mark did, DC Comics agreed to include Bill as a creator of Batman wherever that credit is shown. And in 2017, Mark was featured prominently in a feature-length documentary about the fight for Bill's credit called Batman and Bill. And to this day, he continues to compile new bits of history about Bill on his blog, noblemania.com, ever expanding our knowledge and understanding of the subject. We're incredibly lucky and honored to have Mark on the program. Thanks for coming, Mark. Thank you for having me, Alex. It's now been 15 years since you started the Bill Finger journey, 10 years since the book came out, and seven years since DC gave Bill credit, uh, and then five years since the documentary. Do you ever reflect back on that journey and what you've accomplished? I do reflect back. I mean, it's part of the fabric of my life. It's, you know, that this, this commitment, you know, it's longer than I was in high school. It's longer than I was in college. These formative periods of your life it's right. not longer than my marriage or my kids anymore my kids are not older than my uh, batman uh, bill finger journey but yeah it's hard to spend that much time doing something and not reflect back i mean i don't sit down every day and you know put it on the calendar as something to think about but it, totally. it's become a you know a defining part of my career probably the defining part of my career so far and certainly of my life so yeah i do think about it quite often with with fondness and also sometimes a bit of of um, wistfulness because, you know, it was such a, it was such a thrill and n now it's over <laughs> so because, sure. you know, mission accomplished. Uh, you have to move on to your next cause. Of course. So even today you continue to find information about Bill and post it on your blog. So that work is still ongoing. Uh, a few different times people have talked about a biographical movie for Bill. Do you think there's another big chapter in the Bill Finger story? Do you envision yourself as part of that chapter? I do, but let me backtrack for one moment when you talk sure. about adding to my blog and adding to the Bill Finger record. I would not be doing this podcast if it were not for Alex, who took the time to reach out to me and give me the backstory of this small but cool detail in the Bill Finger story, which is this paperweight that he owned toward the end of his life, which I had the good fortune of inheriting. And this paperweight has taken on a life of its own, both in my family and in fandom, in a way. People ask me about it fairly often, and it's on my blog a lot, and it's in the book. So thank you, Alex, publicly for taking the time to reach out and give me the backstory of the, the production of this paperweight. All I knew before you was that it was purchased in a museum gift shop. I never thought twice about that. I just thought it was one of a million tchotchkes that are untraceable throughout modern history. But Alex you know, gave me all these great details, which I then, with his permission, shared on my blog. I won't get into it here, um, but if anyone's interested, that is on my blog, thanks to Alex. So back to your question, Brian. Uh, I do think there is plenty more room for more Bill Finger content. You know, he hasn't had a voice really in this yet. He's in my book, but you're, you're, you're in a sense, a step removed from him because I'm quoting what little interviews he gave, and also that book has a, a has a certain focus and a certain approach that, you know, is not it's not comprehensive. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, I think there could easily be a scripted feature or series involving Bill. And and your question asked if I would be involved, too. I mean, that would probably not be up to me. But I do think that it adds something to it. Bill's story stands alone. But there's a nice parallel between writers and, um, you know, the the idea of going back and forth in time is 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 could be appealing to some filmmakers or some creators looking at what Bill did and what people were doing, were doing in the, the then present to try to give this man his legacy back. So there's a lot, there's more story that way. The, the more I think about your work, the, the more I'm blown away about how timely it was. You spoke to so many incredible people who are no longer with us. In the book, you gave special thanks to Charles Sinclair, Lynn Simmons, Carmen Infantino, Jerry Robinson, Jerry Bales, Tom Fagan. All of these people you spoke to are, are have, have passed on. Do you have some sense that the history of Bill was fleeting um, and that if you didn't act, that the story might not be told? Absolutely. I felt chased from the first day. I felt like the hourglass had already been turned over and was halfway empty. Because those people you named and a handful more, golden age artists or writers, were the only living people that knew Bill personally. And there were, there were, I'm sure there were more that I, probably not more golden age artists or writers, but more people from his personal life that I I possibly could have found. But, you know, even finding one was great because, again, Bill only gave four known interviews in his life. And that's not enough for someone of his cultural significance. So to find people that had not been interviewed before, mainly the people from his private life. So that would be his second wife, Lynn, and his longtime friend and writing partner, Charles Sinclair, whom he mentioned. Those people had essentially new information, or at least new to the public. So it was for me, it was vital to find those people and win them over or make them feel comfortable enough to talk with me. And luckily, with both those two, Lynn and Charles, it was not a hard sell. They were both honored and thrilled to be able to talk about Bill. Same with all the other people I found for the most part. They were happy to talk about him as well. There's one. Um, the, here's one interesting little anecdote. You might have seen this on my blog. I was speaking with Arnold Drake who was best known for co-creating Dead Man and the Doom Patrol, including Beast Boy. So pretty significant characters now, by, or then and now, but now they're coming into their own with multimedia. You know, they've appeared in other forms. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that, oh, you know who you should talk to? You should talk to this guy, Charles Cashton. He was another writer. He knew Bill. He worked with Bill on the animated 60s. I don't know how Arnold said it, but what Bill did do was he wrote an episode or two of the 1960s Superman cartoons. I think they were Filmation. So he said, I don't know exactly how to reach him, but this is his last known state or where city maybe. I forget exactly that detail. And so when we hung up the phone, I looked up, tried to try to find Charles Cashton, and he had died that week. Mm. So that is exactly the fire that had been lit under my butt since the start oh, where, smells. you know, these people are in their eighties or nineties. You can't wait a day. You can't say, yeah, I'm going to knock off for the night. Tonight's the night to try to find someone because it might be the last night. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm, I'm a, I, I'm a software engineer. I'm not, I'm not really, you know, a, a, a journalist, um, but I'm into history. Um, yeah. and, and I'm an anxious person. I'm like a nervous person. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that I, I reached out to you about about the paperweight, the scarab paperweight. I, you know, I, 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 I'm so nervous when I do something like that because I'm embarrassed about saying something stupid. You know, after I hit send, I'm reading it again, you know, going like, uh, you know, did I did I word it right? Like, did he read it? Um, and I'm, I'm just reaching out to one person. You talk to many, many, many people, you know, cold calls, emails. What's that like trying to chase those things down? Yeah, it's um I don't know that I would say that I'm anxious the way you just described it, but I certainly, I have this, I do have this, uh, I just have, I have this aversion to wanting to waste people's time. I, mm. I don't like to feel like I'm wasting anyone's time. And probably nobody does. But at the same time, it's, I have to convince them that what I'm doing has merit. So I have a, you know, a fraction of a moment if I'm calling and with people that are in their, you know, seventies and older, Calling is really, unless they're super young at heart and, and, and have an internet presence already, it's got to be a call. I mean, it's, even if you find an email, I mean, it's unlikely that they're going to be so 
quick on the draw for that. Sure. So it's almost always a call. And I don't like that because, you know, even though we, we grew, I grew up in the analog era where you had no choice if, but to call first, you couldn't text and say, can I call you? You just mm-hmm. called. So mm-hmm. I have that in my background, in my upbringing, but I still do, you know, hesitate because what if it's a bad time? What if I'm interrupting dinner? What if I'm interrupting something more important? Um, but then I think about the bigger picture, which is that, you know, yes, I'm doing this for my own means, my own, my own um, goal, but I have a larger goal, which is I'm trying to document a story for, you know, people beside myself and people that will be here after me. So I get over it and I call. And, you know, maybe I'm a little nervous, but never so nervous that I don't. Um, sure. And I just have to, I just, it's part of, you know, the process is to just figure out how to be a psychologist with people and how to, you know, get them to feel comfortable with you. And with older people, it's especially challenging in, in some cases. I mean, there were times where I would call someone who doesn't know who I am, of course. And I would say, I got to the point where I would, I would say, my name is Mark. I'm an author. I'm not selling anything. I would have to say that right away. Mm, right. A lot of people assume you're a telemarketer. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And with one person, I remember he said, I said, I, I'm, a, and I would also specify that I'm a children's book author because I thought that sort of would endear me a little, might endear me quicker. Yeah. It's not really That's manipulative because right. it's true. <laughs> and this person said, and I said, I'm calling with a research question. And he said, I'm not interested. And I said, well, that's okay. You don't have to be interested, but I'm hoping that you'll be, you know, willing to take a, a second or two of your time to help me out for this, for this book, which is again, for, for more than just me. And he said, I'm not buying your book. And I said, I- I'm not, I'm not selling my book. In fact, I, there may not be a book. I have, I have no book under contract. I'm doing the research to hopefully sell a book. So don't worry, I'm not selling a book, but they just keep assuming that you're eventually going to get around to a sales pitch. So, yeah. you know, you just keep going until they either hang up or, or, or give in. When, you know, when, once you break down those walls, do you end up making a personal connection with, with some of these people, you know, in the, in the documentary, you know, there's maybe, you know, three to five minutes of like Charles Sinclair in particular. And I'm just thinking, this is such a warm person, you know, there's that he seemed like so kind and, and cared so much about his friend. And I have this sadness about losing someone I never met, you know, yeah. What's that like to talk to someone and then and then have them pass on? Yeah, well, it's tough. I, I did I did grow very fond of Charles and Lynn um, and Carmine and Jerry as well, but they were more mm. in the public eye. So I I I didn't feel like uh, I had an exclusive on them in a way. But with Charles sure. and Lynn, I found them. I mean, they knew who they were, but I was the 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 writer who found them and, and involved them with this story. And I did grow quite fond of both of them, and I was really sad when they both passed. In fact, I was especially sad that I couldn't go to either of their funerals for for, mm-hmm. for different reasons. But, you know, when I found them both, they were very vivid and very lucid and very sharp for mid-80s. Really great. They would both call me at times. Um, you know, Charles, sometimes when I'd call him, he was, you know, he was not able to talk at that moment because he had to go to the gym. So these were not, you know, shrinking violet elderly folks who were just sitting on a couch, you know, you know, riding out their last days, they were still doing things with their life, but also, again, very willing to take time to help uh, me do my part for Bill's legacy. So, yeah, I I was very uh, fond of them both. And I was also thrilled that both of them lived long enough to see the credit change and be in the documentary, although not sure that Charles saw the documentary. Um, But I remember calling Lynn in particular to tell her that Bill got credit. And that was really quite moving. Yeah, I, I, that sounds so it's special. Incredible. So I guess that that's the human element of reaching out and doing research, you know, talking to people and, and so on. But there are other difficult things about the work that you do as well. Like Warner Media is a massive company. They have a, like a $15 billion market capitalization. Did you ever get the sense that you were poking a hornet's nest? Well, not really. Because I was right. I mean, <laughs> I, I, we knew, they knew and I knew, obviously, that that this happened the way that I was going to be telling it. So if I was the first guy, if I was the Jerry Bales back in the 60s, I might have been a, a bit nervous not knowing how this would play out. But now that we've seen, you know, we had seen Bill's name in print, 
many, many times before he was given co-creator status. But that's what he, that was what we needed to have happen. But he, they were not completely neglecting the man's legacy. They just were doing just enough to get, you know, to, I think, you know, they, what they were doing was accurate. It was just not the full story. Mm. So I didn't feel like they would say, you know, this guy's, you know, stirring up secrets. It wasn't a secret, really. I and mean, it was a secret to a lot of fans who just didn't know, but it wasn't a secret to them. In fact, another anecdote about that, when I was uh, going through a book called The Batman, The Complete History by Les Daniels, which came out probably around 1997 or eight around there, that was my fir- one of my first texts that I used as reference. And there were several quotations in that book from Bill that I saw nowhere else. And I really think I un- overturned every you know stone on this. So I emailed Les at the time. Uh, he had, he passed away since, but at the time I was able to reach him. And he said, oh, that was a while ago. I don't have my notes. I don't know where, the, where, the, where those quotations came from, which was frustrating because, I mean, as a writer, you really have to be able to source everything. At least that's how I do it. Most most people would want to do that. You want to have keep your notes because yeah. you never know what's going to come up. So skip ahead a few years, and I was talking with a man named Tom Fagan, whom you mentioned, Alex. He was a super fan who also um, was gracious with his time before he passed away with me. And he ended up um, passing away during my research, and I was told that his house was a treasure trove of comics history. And I knew there was Bill Finger stuff in there, because I knew Tom had met Bill and interviewed Bill, but no one had ever produced that interview as far as we knew. So I was given the green light to come up to his house in Vermont and sleep on the couch and look through the stuff there while he was alive. And then I spoke with someone else who knew Tom and said, well, if you have time, but I'll tell you that a team of five people working eight hours a day for a month straight would not even put a dent in his in his (laughs) material. It's just extremely daunting. So if I was a young man with no, you know, no family, no commitments, no mortgage, I would have probably done it in a heartbeat. But it, that's not reality for me. So I had to take a pass on that for the moment. But then when he passed away, uh, someone that I'd been introduced to, who was one of his friends in the area, was part of the team going through his house. And they found this eight page or 10 page document, the one that I had wanted to find. I wish I knew how long it took them or what, at what stage of the process, but they found it and they sent it to me. It's on my blog. And in that document, is every single quotation from Les Daniels' book. But Les didn't remember, or didn't tell me, maybe. I think he just probably didn't remember, which means that DC Comics had a copy of that on, in their archives, and gave, I'm assuming, and gave it to Les. Otherwise, he, I don't, Les was, did not, I don't believe Les was in touch with Tom Fagan, so Tom didn't mention that. Uh, seems unlikely, which means that DC had this information all along. So, again, it wasn't like I was... You know, and they gave it to an author who used it in a book. So they right, were, not just that he had it; they produced it. They produced it, or they authorized it. So I do. I, I think it's safe to say that they didn't want anybody making more trouble for them than necessary. I mean, you know, they would have, con- I think, continued as they were forever if they could have. I mean, it, as any company would. They, no one, you know, they're not a human being with a heart; they're a business. So. It, there's no incentive for them really to say, look, this is not right. Let's drop everything, find an heir, give her money, give him credit and make a big story about it. They just don't have the, even though it looks great PR wise, they don't have the resources or the incentive to do that. So mm-hmm. I don't feel like I was poking a hornet's nest. In fact, I do feel like people on staff probably were happy that some guy was doing this because they all, mm. a lot of people that work for DC Comics were fans first. And if you ask them sure. confidentially off the record, what do you think about Bill Finger's name being on Batman? They'd say, absolutely. I wish it could happen tonight. They're, they're not. They're, there's no. There's no animosity about it. So I. I feel like people were saying, "Well, we can't do it because we work here." The family wasn't able to do it, so let's just some some nobody try to do it and see how far he gets. Well, and there were so many people that were sort of DC adjacent, like Kevin Smith and and Mike Uslan and and Kevin Conroy. You know, like you you were able to sort of marshal a a campaign. A, you know, a, a public. Uh, and they they were they came out of the woodwork right they they did podcasts yeah. and panels and um what mm-hmm. was it like meeting those people and and working with them and it was great I, I i mean they were all the three you mentioned were extremely gracious kevin smith put me on his fast fast tracked me onto his podcast in january 
2014 because we were I was trying for a Google Doodle for Bill for his 100th birthday, which was in February 2014, so less than a month later. In the back of my mind, I, I, I figured, look, they've probably planned these things out for years in advance. So even if, you know, the Queen of England, you know, calls in, I don't think they're going to they're going to change their their schedule for us. But uh, it was really nice that he was willing to do that. He'd never heard of me. Most none of these people had ever heard of me. Same with Michael Uslan. He he gave me a blurb for the back for the book. You know, and again, didn't know me, didn't and and just believed in the cause. It was not about me. It was about Bill. They were doing it for Bill. Kevin Conroy, super gracious guy, did that panel that you mentioned. Also, Kevin, also all three of those guys did that panel I did in New York in, in um, 2014. And and I just uh, you know I was I was humbled, but I then I realized well it's not really my place to be humbled because this is, as I keep saying, not about me. Right. Um, right. So and they they went above and beyond. I mean you know mm-hmm. Michael was in the documentary, so was Kevin. Uh, Kevin Conway came to the to the street renaming in the Bronx after when um, the Bronx uh, renamed a street in Bill Finger's honor. You know, Kevin probably had 1,600 other things to do, but he took the time to come up to the Bronx on a freezing cold morning to honor the co-creator of a character that he did very well by, but still owed nothing to. Sure. He just did it because he's a good person. Yeah, and maybe he's a fan too. To be honest, I don't even know if he's a fan, but I I believe he did it just because he's a good person. So it was really nice of all of them to to do this. They're all busy people and they were extremely gracious and still are. So in, in, in doing research about um, the creation of, of Batman, I, I noticed that, that some of the stories that are in Batman and Bill and also Bill the Boy Wonder, they appear in, in Batman and Me, the, the Bob King autobiography. Um, things like the fact that Bob and Bill would frequent Poe Park, the story about Bill reshaping Bob's costume uh, to the one that we, we know today um, it also has some stories that just defy belief. Like there's there's um, a story where he's like swinging from like a block and tackle, which is like, you know, a pulley <laughs> to like, you know, do flying kicks of like gang members when he's a youth. Right. right? There's the, the sort of infamous 1934 Birdman drawing. How do you go about separating that fact from fiction? And and to what degree did Bob's book inform who you interviewed and how you interviewed them and, and did research? That's a great question. So Bob Kane built a career by being deceptive or selectively omitting important information. So that does make him an un- unreliable narrator. Because of that, when he mentioned Bill in the book, I took that very seriously. Because someone that that is so much about, look at me, you know, Look what I did. Look who I am. Look how great I am. Someone is, who's that narcissistic, when they break free of that and talk about someone else in a positive way, to me, that is, it gives it more weight because this is not something that he typically did. That said, I prefer to have multiple sources for any fact that I cite. And I, I couldn't say for sure, but I think Bill himself talked about the original costume in the Starenko book, 1970 History of Comics, I think. Don't quote me on that. Mm, I, sure. It's a little rusty. But I, and it may, if it's not there, it may be somewhere else as well. Because I did prefer not to rely solely on Bob if I could avoid that. Yeah. But if it was something positive in Bill's favor, I, I tended to, to give it some, you know, some weight. Because you know, this was out of character for, for Bob. But then you look at the, grand, you know, the whole scope of things. And there's another interview with Bob, which I think was in the 1989 comics ma- comics interview magazine the year that the batman first tim burton film came out mm. when he he admits being hazy on the details he said i think i created penguin or riddler i'm not sure maybe maybe bill like he was in print saying i'm not really sure yeah which is natural when you're <laughs> you know 75 years old so it, it was it was a little bit bit touch and go with some of this but you know i did speak with a whole bunch of other people some of whom we've mentioned already, and some of it's already in print. So you just have to distill, you know, I sometimes would say, how many times does, how many times in the research does someone say that, that Penguin was created by Bill? How many times does someone say it was Bob or more? Would I, and I just have to, like any writer, you have to just make an, 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 a, an educated guess based on what, what you, what you know, what, even if it's very little. Sure. So the fact that Bob, in his autobiography, gives Bill credit very, very poignantly, I might add, was, was for me, was 
the you know was the the golden egg it was just that was it i just felt like that was so significant um now he was likely in fact he was nudged to, to, that didn't come from him alone tom andre his the, the man who really wrote the book who's now a, a colleague and a friend without tom there would be no bill in that book at all so i always make a point to to, to give tom credit for for nudging bob this is you know you before this book you know Bob was the monolith of Batman. And here this guy saying, well, maybe you want to mention Bill in your own autobiography. Maybe that would be a good thing to do. That's That takes chutzpah yeah. to be the guy to do that. Telling someone else how to tell his life story and give other people credit for stuff that he's been taking credit for. He did it. And Bob yeah. agreed. So, wow. yeah, and all that stuff informed what I was what I was willing to believe and what I was suspicious of. Sure. One of the things that impresses me about about the end product of your work in in the book, uh, it's it's got incredible focus and and clarity. Knowing the truth <laughs> that Bob was kind of a selfish guy, uh, it's hard for me to not be like angry about that. I, I think if I was in your shoes, it would be difficult for me to not just write like a takedown, <laughs> right? Like this, uh, just yeah. a, a story about how awful Bob was. And yet your book is is so measured, right? Um, it puts Bill at I think the rightful center of the story. It, 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 you know, setting the record straight. Can you talk about your strategy and your approach and how you frame yeah. telling that story? Well, my goal was to build up Bill, not to tear down Bob. But I always get this mixed up. Is it mutually exclusive or not mutually exclusive? To build up Bill, you have to tear down Bob. You just don't have mm. to do it in a cruel way. But it's kind of like if you see two people and... Uh, one of them wants to get your attention, but instead you focus on the other person. You know, you're at a party and two people come up and they want to get time with you. And one person starts talking and you look to the other person and start talking to that person. You're showing what's important by what you're ignoring. Mm. So by focusing on Bill's role and ignoring and not, you know, having Bob in the book, except when I absolutely needed to, that was making a statement in and of itself. It wasn't calculated. It was just the way it was. But I, everything that I needed to say about Bill had, you know, was what overrode what Bob was doing at the mm. time. So That's it was not, it was, it, it, I'm, it's nice to hear people say it was measured. I'm, I'm glad that it seems that way, but it was really just a function of telling the story properly means that Bill does get that kind of real estate in the book. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you watch the film and you see Bob speak for himself, I mean, I don't need to expand on that i think a lot of people that don't know anything about the story and see that instantly can feel what kind of person he was from that alone without knowing yeah. the whole history of bill finger's role i mean it's just he comes across a certain way you know it's writers like to let characters you know speak for themselves in a, in a sense and he was able in the film he does that great the book is different but in the film he just you know i, I didn't have to say much critical of him at all because he just shows it on his he wears it on his sleeve Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you were telling that story of Tom Andre, like going up to bat, you know, for Bill with Bob. And I just am thinking back to to that interview that he did where the, he's asking him about giving up the rights and he's, he's talking about the pie. I own a, a piece of the Batman. And so you still have a you still have a copyright on Batman? Well, everyone wants to know that, don't they? It's a, I'll, yeah, let you I figure it, <laughs> I'll let you figure it out. I answered it before. A piece of it. <laughs> a piece of it. OK. It's a pie. <laughs> It's a pie that's cut up pie. And he really kind of gives that interviewer a lot of attitude. And I just, you know, can't imagine like he seemed so, so ready to, he was very pushy, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on one aspect of these, per, these people's lives, which is their role in Batman. I'm not writing an in-depth biography, of either one of them about their private life, their personal, their political views, their favorite sports team, their favorite right. smoothie. I mean, that doesn't come up. So when people have asked me, because there, there are people that actually interpret either the book or the movie particularly as that I bashed Bob, which I find, to be mm. honest, silly, because I really didn't. I mean, I, 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 at least I don't feel that I did. I was certainly trying to be measured in the film as well. Mm -hmm. But the overall takeaway from the film is that Bob is being bashed because he's being exposed as, as a fraud, in a sense. Right. But when someone has in public, like at a, after a lecture, has said, you know, why why were you so harsh against Bob? I'll say, well, again, I'm, it's funny that you, I'm not funny, I'm, 
I'm interested that you see it that way. I see it completely differently. But I have to be clear that I'm not talking about Bob overall. I, I hope that Bob was a great son and a great dad and a great husband and a great friend. Because privately, he could have been those things. Mm. But professionally, he did things that I feel and most people that know the story feel are unethical. Mm -hmm. And I cannot respect that. So when I criticize the man, I'm criticizing that part of him. I want to hope that there was good in him in other ways. But again, that's beyond the scope of my project. Mm. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. You're essentially saying that all of his personal details are completely irrelevant to the story you're reporting, right? Yeah. And I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that. Sure. Um, so th then in the book, you mentioned that Bill would eat uh, chicken noodle soup during late night writing sessions. Um, he took foreign films. Uh, he took in foreign films, excuse me, and played darts with Jerry Robinson. It seems like you were searching for the personality and humanity of Bill. Um, were you able to find that and get a sense of what it would be like to be around him? You're asking, you're both asking great questions. I, I, as I told you, I rarely do podcasts, but this, you're making it worthwhile because these are not the typical questions. Yeah, you need to know the guy's personality to write a book about him. And I needed that from mainly from Charles and Lynn because they knew him the best and were, right. they were the living people who knew him the best. So those little details I put in partly because they, they're relatable to kids, which is my primary audience, but right. also because they humanize them. Mm -hmm. And we needed that. So, you know, you don't get that deep of a read on his personality, I would say, not just for my book, but in general. I mean, you know, the movie, Lynn and Charles talk about him. But I think, you know, the main takeaway that a lot of people have about Bill's personality is that why did he not do more on his own behalf? That's a, that's, and the kids especially latch onto that because at a certain age, that they're very much about right and wrong and good and bad. And it's black and white you know, from like fourth to sixth or seventh grade, it's pretty black mm -hmm. and white. Like either you're doing something good or you're doing something bad. So they sometimes say, well, wh wh why? Why did this happen? Why was Bob mean? Why was why did Bill not speak up? And, you know, he probably did. Unfortunately, that's not been documented. Um, so I could, I, there was one letter I found that's on my blog where he does show some backbone about the situation. But you want to believe that the hero of the story tried to save himself before other people step in. Mm. Um, but I can't make it up. It's nonfiction. So that is a, a fatal flaw. And every character needs to have weaknesses. And, mm -hmm. and, and even if it's nonfiction, you need to be open about that. Like, he's not perfect. I'm not saying he's a hero. He did everything right. But yeah, so I did try to you know humanize him with, with details uh, when I didn't have so much on his personality. He was... And he was intelligent. Apparently, he was fun to be at, be with at parties, but not the life of the party. He wasn't the center of attention. He was certainly a very educate, self-educated, so he had things to talk about. He read a lot. Uh, he was also athletic. I mean, he had he was fairly well-rounded. He just wasn't, again, you know, the uh, probably the most dynamic presence in a group. Mm. I guess in in contrast to that, so in Batman and B, Bob's book, um, he cites the Pulp Fiction character, The Shadow, a movie called The Bat Whispers, and Zorro as inspirations for Batman. Were you able to get a sense of what some of Bill's inspirations for Batman and his stories were? Uh, those <laughs> that you said. Okay. Bob was saying them, but, I mean, Bill was the reader, so he would have probably... Maybe Bob read The Shadow. I, I don't know. To, or I don't know. Or listen to the radio shows. But of the two, Bill was was more was was definitely a reader. And I, I would imagine Bob was not much of a reader at all. Maybe other comics. But I don't think he was reading much beyond that. And that's a that's a that's a speculation. And I, you know, Zorro. I'd have to go back and look in the notes. I don't remember if Bill said much about Zorro. But uh, I know that he said that the that the um, the blank pupils or the lack of pupils in Batman's costume. That was Bill's uh, idea, but taken from The Phantom, another pulp character mm. that predates Batman. Comic strip character, I should say. Bill was very open about his, 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 um, his swipes, you know, where he got ideas from. And at the beginning, he, he did swipe. But then he, he, you know, did a 180 and became, you know, a, just a visionary for the field and what, what he brought to it in terms of psychological depth and 
range of char- types of characters and just longevity. I mean, 25 mm-hmm. years. So he he started off, you know, inauspiciously, you could say, and at least in the first story or two, but then really had it in him to do great. And that's very common. Like, you know, you think about, I'm not so fresh on this, but I remember people were saying the first season of Seinfeld was pretty weak tea. But in those days, you'd let things you'd let things percolate a bit. You wouldn't just can't kill it if it doesn't sure. get certain numbers in in one in one season or one, you know, in the beginning. And look what happened. So, and there's something to that in the creative field. Like if people are given the chance to breathe creatively, once they get their foot in the door, if they're given that opportunity, maybe there's greatness there that they just didn't tap from day one. So that's what happened with Bill. I got in touch with you a little while back uh, about about the paperweight. Do, do you mind telling the story of the paperweight? Sure. So Charles Sinclair was the first big find in my research. And big for a couple reasons. One is that he knew Bill and wrote with Bill and, and, and wrote the only episode of the Batman TV show that Bill was involved in. So that's a significant detail. And... Also, I didn't know this before I found him, but also significant because his mind was a steel trap. He Mm. remembered things that many people would not. And he also was consistent, which which not everybody is. So, you know, when you're doing research over a period of time, sometimes you ask someone a question. And then if you bring it up again a few months later, their memory is different because that's human. We're all we're all (laughs) we're all victim to that. So he was not like that. He was mm. consistent straight through. So that for me was, was, you know, reassuring. So his name is Charles Sinclair. He was not famous. So if you Google Charles Sinclair, you will find 300 people. But you can <laughs> narrow that down pretty quickly by the age range. But I didn't know exactly how old he was or even if he was still alive. But mm. it was still, you know, and I don't remember... If, how many, but you know, not a small number of people named Charles Sinclair that I would have to look for. My first thought was Hollywood. I mean, if you worked in the film and TV business, but I don't, I have to look back in my notes. I don't remember why I took a chance on a Brooklyn number first instead of Hollywood. Mm. But of all the numbers I found, I called the Brooklyn one first and it was Charles. It was the right one. And he was still wow. alive. It was great. Yeah, first one. Incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And I lived in Connecticut at the time, so not a far train ride. So I went to meet with him multiple times, of course. And the, But the first time I went, he, we talked and we were trying to find this picture in the, oh, I had already gone to Bill's uh, alma mater, his high school, and I had photocopied class photos, which was, you know, this is a 1932 or 33 yearbook, grainy to begin with, and I'm photocopying it pre-iPhone, showing Charles and saying, do you happen to... Can you see it bills in these? I mean, it was, you know, it was futile. But then he said, I do have something of bills. Actually, I have two things of bills. One was a little sculpture that Bill had made of his first wife, Portia. And you can Google that and see it on my blog. Bill's granddaughter, Athena, has that now, as she should. Oh, cool. And the other thing was he took out this Ziploc baggie off of his big shelf of books and other stuff. And he said, it was this paperweight. And he said, this was bills. And he took it out of the, the bag and he said, and I'd like to give it to you. And I said, Charles, I would love to have that, but I cannot accept it. He was your best friend. Yeah. And Charles said, Mark, I can already tell that you will take good care of it. Mm. So when he put it like that, yeah, of course I had to say yes. So I put it on my desk because I wrote a book about the guy whose desk it used to be on. And then some, some time later, not long after, I was speaking on the phone with Lynn, Bill's second wife. And I mentioned that Charles, who, who knew, they knew each other. I mean, they're contemporaries and they knew each other back mm-hmm. in the 60s. They hadn't stayed in touch or anything. But I said uh, to Lynn that Charles had given me uh, one of apparently one of Bill's last surviving belongings, which was a paperweight. And Lynn said, was it a scarab? And I said, yes, it was. What? How did you know that? And she said, well, if it's what I'm thinking of, I gave it to him. It was a gift. No way. Uh, I bought it at the American Museum of Natural History. I want to say it was circa 1970. Mm. Could be off off on that. But it aligns with the timeline of what Alex sent me, you know, when these things were in production. And so it's just funny how these things have a way of, yeah. you know, spiraling. This tiny little piece of metal that when you, you wouldn't pay second glance to it. And it's become such a big part of my story. It's not 
addressed in the book. It's not mentioned at all in the movie. But when I mention it in my talks, the kids freak out. And adults, too. They love it. It's a cool story. Lo- it's such a little... It's a great story. It's a cool story. And I love the... <laughs> I love the... The, the the fact that when I, when I show, when I show the paperweight, I don't even bring it with me to schools. I just show a picture on the screen mm. after I've shown it in the book. So the kids just see it in the book and think it's just a detail in the book. And then I show that I have the real thing. Every, every audience for 12 years, every single one has gasped mm. and it's a paperweight. So I tell <laughs> right. teachers afterward, it's hilarious. If I told you in advance, I halfway through, I'm going to show a paperweight and these kids are going to freak out. <laughs> they would say, it's not, they don't even know what a paperweight is. They don't even know what paper is. Sure. So, <laughs> It's it's just funny that this thing, something like that, can have this kind of a ripple effect. Mm. And Charles is right. You have been taking good care of it, right? And well, yeah, except, yeah, I, I have for the most part. Uh, you want another story about it when I wasn't taking good care of it? Sure. sure. It's, short, it's shorter. So I used to take <laughs> it um, to, to talks and sure. show it in person, which got mm-hmm. a, a big reaction. So I would take it in my carry-on, of course, because I would never, I'd barely check a bag anyways, but I would never mm. check something valuable. And right. so I was going through the, the, the security in Reno, Nevada. Mm. And he said, what's this? And I said, um, that's Bill Finger's paperweight. And of course he said, who's Bill Finger? And I said, well, there is a long story there, but the short version is co-creator of Batman. And that's one of the only things he owned that still survives. And he said, well, I'm sorry. It's also a weapon. You can't take it on the plane. You could hurt someone with that. Mm. And you know how it is. You're not supposed to negotiate with TSA agents. And I said, I respect that. I'm a regular traveler. That said, <laughs> it is the only one. Is there anything I can do so that you'll allow me to take it on this plane? And he said, if you, if you never take it with you on a plane again. Not mm. that he could check this. but I, And I said, done. I don't want to risk it anyway. So I won't take yeah. it with me again. And to that day... To this day, I've not taken it on a plane. If I ever move, I have to drive because you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, I, the the format of the show that we've done so far, it's it hasn't been an interview show. It's it's I I um shirk my responsibilities, <laughs> and and I read books and I, I Google things and I do research and I make notes and then I read my notes to Brian and he acts interested. Um, <laughs> and 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 I was just um you know just pouring over your blog because there's so much good stuff in there mm-hmm. and we're going chronologically we're starting at the beginning and the plan is to hopefully you know work work through all of the, uh, the batman history and i found a post about the scarab where you said that you didn't know what it said and i just said i can figure that out uh uh yeah. which you know I, I was maybe uh too bold of a, a prediction because like i was like um trying to find like egyptologists like don't ever google like you know Egyptologist for hire, like in Google, you're not going to find anything. I reached out to my my sister, who is um, a PhD candidate at, at University of Indiana. I was like, "Do you know any Egyptologists?" Which is, in hindsight, also dumb. And she 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 was the one actually. She Googled something like you know you know gold scarab replica or something like that, and an image popped up on image search that was a different scarab. But I took the file name and I you know went back and it was a different M- Amenhotep. Scarab, and then all of a sudden I'm on the Wikipedia page, and I'm reading a, a translation of what I thought was a different scarab, and I was like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> those are the same symbols that are on yeah. on 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 Bill Scarab." I promise I'm getting to a question here, you know. And I did all of that online, and you found Athena, Bill's granddaughter, online as well through MySpace, I believe. Um, right. And 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 reading through your blog, you know, it seemed like so much of your work was writing letters, phone calls, physically going places. Does does the technology change your work? Do you, you know, as you do nonfiction moving forward, does more of that happen online? Well, online is cheap. You can do it from home. Sure. Not that I don't like traveling. It's, there's excitement there too. But um, yeah, I start online with everything. I mean, we all do. And then, mm. you know, but the best stories are offline. So sometimes you, you can find, a, you know, an arrow online that takes you offline, which is, which, which was a lot of the stuff you saw in the film. Mm. So, yeah, but I mean, you know, your your story is living proof that, you know, the Internet's fantastic, but it, it's, first of all, it doesn't have nearly everything that, it, that you want. But also, it could have things that you do want and you have no way to know. Like, it blew my mind that there was, that there was a Wikipedia entry about these paperweights. Yeah. These replica paperweights. 
I mean, it was in hiding in plain sight all these years. And it doesn't change anything for my story, but it's just astounding that it was, and I, and in fairness, I never actually tried to find out what it said or looked into the paperweight. I just, my, for me, it stopped at, oh, it was bought at the Natural History Museum, like millions of other tchotchkes in in history. So what, what's the, what's the point of even searching? And I only put it on my blog as a challenge to kids. Because I sure. thought that would be a fun way to get them to do some research. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they, which is which is okay. They can still yeah. do it. They won't find. I'm not going to look at all 300 bill finger posts. They won't see the one I did with you <laughs> with your information. They'll maybe they'll find the one that I. I'm still going to put it out to them, like trying yeah. to find out what it means. And now that I know that it's out there, maybe someone will find, will find it. Um, but yeah, the internet can be a, a great uh, resource. And you know, I I've learned a lot of great little tricks um, doing this in terms of internet uh, searching. So yeah, it was in this, because of this, because of Bill Finger, it was sure. a great. Um, it was a great learning curve for me. So I like reverse questions. So it's like, you have a lot of insight. You've done a lot of interviews. You've done a lot of research. Is there a aspect of the Bill Finger story or of Batman or, or, a question that people don't ask you that you think is an interesting like rabbit hole to dive down? That is a great question. Well, there are, are a few things that ha- that don't come up much that I think are interesting. One is that the, 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 the story is that they never added Bill's name until they did because of Bob Kane's contract. Mm. Yet that contract has never been revealed. Mm. So, and I realized that I, in my source material, I don't know where that was, where that first came up, where Bob's Mm. contract states, it has to be Bob's name alone on Batman. It certainly Mm -hmm. is in character, right? But I don't know where it says that. And I, I, I could have missed it in my source material when I revisited it recently, but I don't think so. So the question then is, was that the kind of thing that just came up on a message board or at Comic-Con and passing and then became solidified as as true because it sounds true or Mm -hmm. is it actually is there some textual evidence for that like you know bill's death you know the few people that had any inkling before i did research said he was buried in a pauper's grave and you know i realized that 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 was most likely just an assumption based on a a sad life and the fact that no one had ever seen his grave on find a grave so i don't know where that originated but it wasn't true so maybe Mm -hmm. the bob king contract thing is similar during the making of the movie, it became clear to me that if that were the case, then that would probably come. DC Comics would have an incentive to to, to show that and Produce say, "Well, it, yeah. we're not being dicks. Uh, the contract that we, you know, the legal document says we cannot change it." Right. Mm-hmm. But they didn't do that, at least not publicly. So I don't know if that's true. So I, I, there's not much more to talk about because I don't know. But that's an yeah. interesting thing that sometimes people. Um, yeah, I tried to I couldn't find a question in there, but that was something that struck me in the documentary was and blink if you'll miss it. The one of the lawyers was Athena's half sister, which I thought was incredible. Right. That story of like, why didn't they produce this document? They were talking yes. about all these meetings. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to understand, like, what are these conversations like? What are these right. negotiations? Yes. But and I even said it in the documentary. I said they they have no obligation to, to, to show the contents of their vault, not realizing that, well, in this kind of context, they, it benefits them to do that. If right, the document right. says Bob contractually gets, I mean, of course, contracts, I mean, everything, most lawsuits, involve, a lot of lawsuits are to challenge a contract. So it's not like contracts are, are, are you know, right. like behind bulletproof, acid-proof glass. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still, that's an interesting point. Another point that I did blog about, it. I don't know if you got to that blog post yet, is that if it came to a lawsuit, what is the legality of the or of the of the genesis of Batman. So mm-hmm. if Bob was a freelancer and Bill was even more removed than that, and Bill creates something that Bob then sells to a company, but under false pretense, right. what does that say for the legality of who owns it? Right. If it wasn't even Bob's in the first place. If it wasn't I, his see, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I have no sure. idea. But I don't know if I mean, that would have had any Does it belong to everyone then? Right? Yeah. I don't know if that would have even been a factor if it did go to some kind of a case, but I just thought that was worth noting that Mm -hmm. it wasn't like Bob was a employee or was under a certain contract. He was, so I don't know if that would have, 
It seemed sure. to be it could could work in Bill's favor, but I, I don't know. I hope I hope I hope we find more out. Well, more. you're proof that it, I mean, I get I get emails. I mean, you know, and I like from people like you that I mean, the paperweight is not. It's really interesting. It's not seismic, of course, but it's interesting. Sure. But mm-hmm. you never know who's gonna, you know, like the the ashes thing. Mm. Um, that was never in print anywhere. That his that his body was cremated and that Fred spread his dad's ashes on a beach. That came just from individuals. So mm. some people would say, "Where's your? Where is it in writing?" I'm like, "Well, sometimes you get something from a human being for That's how. Mm. That's the, mm-hmm. the start of the of the of the fact. I got it from two different people who don't know each other and were not in the same room and did not know what the other said. So there's no like collusion here. There's not like, let's make up this really poignant story about what happened. They have no incentive to do that. So there's two, there's two ways to analyze that. Either someone made it up a long time ago and these two people fell for it, or more likely it's true. And these two people mm-hmm. are remembering correctly. Mm-hmm. And then at one of my talks, a third person who came up, came up to me who knew Portia, Bill's first wife and said, I heard that Ashes story from Porsche. Wow. So it's, you know, it's a, sl- it's, a, it's a slam dunk by then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On our show, the very first episode, Alex and I talked about our very earliest memory of Batman. So I pose that question to you. What is your very earliest memory of, of Batman? For, for instance, mine, I was like four years old and my parents got me a, it's called a Quillow. It's a quilt that can fold into a pillow. And it's got Batman on it. And that's my very earliest memory that I can think of of Batman other than like getting into some of the, the action figures and stuff like that. So what's your earliest memory of Batman? Well, first of all, I've never heard of Quillows. I'll have to look that up, too. There's probably a Wikipedia entry for that as well. <laughs> there must be. Yeah. Well, I have a more vivid early memory of Superman. I couldn't be I couldn't be 100% certain about Batman. I mean, I was a huge Super Friends fan. It was probably sure. Super Friends. I also had a Batman Mego doll. You guys are younger than me, I'm guessing, but... Uh, do you know what Amigo dolls are? I know what Amigo is. Okay. Yeah. So I had a bunch of them, including Batman. And it might have been, it was probably Super Friends first and Amigo second. Do you have, do you have a favorite Batman story? Yeah, Bill's is my favorite Batman story. But Fair if you're enough. talking fiction, you're probably talking fiction. I am, uh, but, I, you know. I, you know, I disappoint people sometimes because I don't have it as encyclopedic, um, my knowledge of Batman stories are not as encyclopedic as people would expect. Sure. But my favorite, I, I think, you know, would would be uh, Year One, mm. eighty seven, uh, Frank Miller. Uh, that I would I would say that's my favorite. That's a favorite for me as well. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. Do you have a, a a recent book, a current book, a, a project you want to tell us about? What are you working on? Well, nothing with superheroes. Nothing with Batman. Fair enough. Um, I mean, I have a kid. Brian has a kid. We're interested in yeah. we're interested in, in your in your books generally. You know, we have children. Oh well, thank you, thank you. Well, I am working on some other quirky nonfiction that will, in my mind, will be picture books as well. Um, I like these untold stories, but I like the stories that there's a high profile angle. So mm. with Batman, it's easy. Everyone knows Batman. Most people, sure. even fans, knew nothing about Bill Finger. So mm-hmm. I would say it's the secret behind Batman. It's a pretty quick and easy pitch. Um, so the two that I'm working on now. Not quite the same type of thing, but mm-hmm. one is, is a Holocaust story and not a okay. famous one. So no one would have heard about it. But it's just mm-hmm. it's a gr- the hook is that it's very it, it's there's there's it's not all grim. There are people that mm. survive in a sure. dramatic way. And it's also about paying tribute, which is mm. a theme of my work as well with Bill. And then another book I'm working on is is a um, a Vietnam War story. And I'm not a war buff. I just keep finding these stories these tiny stories tucked in the folds of a huge traumatic event that I like. I don't want to, I not, I would not be good at writing this, you know, vast history of some complex event like a war. Mm -hmm. But if it's one small human or group of people story in that bigger story, um, I love that kind of thing. That's awesome. So I can't say too much about it, but it's a really, um, in the end, it's a very uplifting story about the end of the Vietnam War. Well, Mark, it's it's been an honor to speak with you. Um, Indeed. The work you've done is incredibly important for our, our understanding of pop culture and of, of Batman. And thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. And I'm glad that we made this connection, you know, not just on the podcast, but in life. Yeah, that's awesome. If you like the show, 
You can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, recommend us in Overcast, tell your friends about the show, and help us find an audience so we keep putting out episodes. You can find all of our episodes and show notes at batlessons.com. You can send us comments, questions, or corrections to contact at batlessons.com, or you can tweet at us at batlessons. Until next time, I'm Alex Cash. And I'm Brian Anders. Thanks for listening. 